He said, before you guys taste, before we do anything more, which is your favorite wine and why? And I had kids in my class from all over Europe and South America, and they were so proud of their national wines. And they were, you know, sort of saying that we have this wine in Italy. And of course, the Frenchies were talking about their wines and then the wines from Chile. Um, and I felt very proud of being Indian. I've always been very proud of it. And I was like, I think Sula Chanon Blanc is amazing. And he looked at me and he was like, we have a lot of work to do with you. Like, <laughs> don't even don't even bring piss water into my class. And I was like, <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Indian Explorers. In this podcast, we talk about Indian success stories all over the world. I am Sabrina, and together with my co-host, Amit Naval Rai, we will get to understand the journey of our guests and what really drives them. The optimism, patience, courage, and idealism is what we want to bring to life of our guests. So if you enjoy the show, please subscribe, share it with others, and introduce us to our next guest. So without further ado, hey, good morning, Amit. Good morning, Sabrina. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Very good. Very good. And uh, happy Bitcoin Pizza Day. Bitcoin Pizza Day? Yeah. I have no and, idea uh, what you're talking about. So um, in 2010, May 22nd, okay. we're recording today, May 22nd. Um, the famous programmer uh, bought two pizzas from Papa John's using 10,000 Bitcoins. And oh, those 10,000 Bitcoins uh, are worth today close to 270 million US dollars. Ah, okay. You know, it's funny. I am, um, I feel like I don't know much about like virtual currency. Uh, how much 10,000 Bitcoin at that time was worth what? Nothing? Let's just say at the peak, dollars. at the peak, it was worth 690 US million dollars. Today, okay, it's worth 270. When, when they bought the when pizzas, bought good question. I have no idea. Um, right? I think it was worth, I think, well, it was worth the value of two pizzas. So you can imagine, you know, 40 so. bucks, 50 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So Sabrina, I, I'm today, curious where this virtual yeah. currency is going to go because it's virtual. Like we don't see it. We don't touch it. It's so fascinating. I'm selling something on a online garage sale on Facebook and the lady's like, can, can I Venmo you a deposit? I said, sure. And I'm still thinking like, but it's not actual money. Isn't that, it's just so fascinating to me. Yeah. I don't know, but my portfolio is, uh, down 85 percent so let's not talk about that today oh, yeah. that today i know we, it's down <laughs> yeah today we got a foodie on the show so uh, i want to i wanted to ask you uh since we got a foodie today uh i did some homework and i had no idea about how they came up with these michelin stars you know this famous red booklet mm. that's produced once a year yeah of do course. you know do you yeah. know anything tell me I, what do you know i don't know how it started I don't know much. I don't know how it started. I know there is a group of individuals who travel around the world and rank them, but that's as far as I know. Tell me more. What do you know? They are, they are spies. Nobody knows their names. This was Michelin. You know the famous oh. French multinational, the car, the, the tire company? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, it, they, they are the ones who actually produce the Michelin Guide. It started in 1900s, 1900, when okay. people were starting, when people started to drive around in cars, they decided, let's help our guests, i.e. our drivers, our consumer, let's give them recommendations of places to stay and places to eat. And that's when they came up okay, with the I idea. Okay, I had no idea. That's fascinating. I had no idea that it was the same Michelin tires company that started Neither this. Neither did I. Neither oh, did I. 1920. Cool. Yeah, and in 1926, they started the one star, two star, and three star, the star ratings, uh, you know, yes, yeah. for Michelin stars. And uh, today, they're still as popular and as famous as ever. And uh, I find more. it, yeah, yeah, it's become pretty big. And I thought it was such a good pivot for a tire company to be so well known. I think that the second largest tire company in the world. And here they have a completely different vertical 
restaurant business and they are the the excellent standards. I thought it was uh, yeah. amazing. So you're you're a foodie, our whole family is. Do you when you travel to new cities, do you look for Michelin star restaurants and make reservations? I do, I do the opposite. Okay. I, I normally do TripAdvisor or I, I ask the locals. For me, okay. uh, these fancy dining three-star Michelin restaurants that you have to book four months in advance and you see the photographs and they have the dishes are like this tiny and there's gases coming yeah. out all over the place. For me, that's a turnoff. But, uh, but that's so I would love to go to them, but I'm married to a non-foodie who doesn't understand why our family like digs into each other's plates at a family at a restaurant. And so it would be a way most of these places are like, <laughs> I don't know if that's what you call it here in America, but <laughs> maybe in Chile okay, you do, but you know, for him, it's like, he just survives on, you know, fresh broccoli and he's good. So it'd be totally waste for us to go. So I need company when we travel to go to these places. I think we got to get your husband in one of the episodes, and, Sabrina. And, and I'm going to get a Bitcoin expert as well to talk about crypto. Fair? Yes. I, yeah, I think I need to learn about Bitcoin. But I think today's guest might, if I finally get to meet her in person one day, maybe she'll join me at a Michelin star. Why don't you introduce us to our, our guest and let's get going. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so today's guest is Simran Savlani. She graduated from Le Cordon Bleu. I like saying that, Paris in 2017 with a diploma in culinary management and is doing it all within the food industry. She's a food consultant and has helped open several restaurants, Bombay, Lagos, Jakarta, Hong Kong, and the list goes on and on. Um, what else and is more? She, she's also an author of an Asian vegetarian cookbook with over 116 recipes I have just acquired the book and sent it as an anniversary gift to a friend of mine in Bombay, and they absolutely loved it. In addition to that, she's also created under this uh, Spark of Madness, that's the name of her book, she's created these sources. The sources are actually uh, inspired from, uh, from Hong Kong, where I believe she lives. And she's also uh, got a website where she sells these four sources. And she also is a consultant and sets up pop-up dinners all over the world, which are called a mad dinner. So I'm really excited to find out more about all this and see what we can learn. Hi, Simran. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hi, Simran. For... Hi, Amit. Hi, Sabrina. Thanks for having me and part of the Indian Explorers podcast. Super excited to be here. Oh, what did we miss here. out? We appreciate it. Yeah. What did we miss out? What, we... what else have you done? You seem to have done everything. Oh, I was like, wait, what else have you missed out? I'm looking at the list and just making sure. I thought that was a technical question. I was like, you're asking me? Um, no, you covered it all. That was a very good introduction. Sometimes I forget things I've done myself, which is good because you forget all the stupid things you've done in life as well. Then, um, But no, you've got everything perfectly right. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. We're excited to get to know you better. Um, you are in Hong Kong right now, correct? I am. It is okay. 11 something PM in Hong Kong right now. Hong Kong has okay. been home for the last 20, more than 20 years right now. Okay. And there's an 11 hour difference. So thanks for making this work for us. Um, but you were born in Taiwan, right? Yes. I'm a made okay. in Taiwan baby, as they like Perfect. to say so, it from the 80s. Oh, how, say it again. A made in Taiwan baby. Do you remember in the 80s? Oh, all yes. The toys Used to be made yes. in Taiwan toys. So I like to say that I'm a so made cute. in Taiwan baby. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So you're born in Taiwan. You live in Hong Kong. You've moved throughout Asia. And that's what we want to get to know today. So let's start with the beginning. What shaped you? What made you want to go into this business? What, what has been important to you growing up? Sure. I guess all stories start with once upon a time. Um, yes, correct. So I'm a made in Taiwan baby. I lived there for like a first, the first few years of my life. And um, my parents wanted to, you know, Taiwan was sort of like dying out. All the manufacturing companies were moving out to China. So my parents wanted to move the entire family to India and get their spoiled American kids a proper Indian background and sort of like cultural immersion program. So they moved us to Bombay. We didn't speak, we spoke Hindi, but with an accent, we weren't fully ready for what was coming our way. Um, but my mom had this 
mission to make sure that we are so embedded into the culture and the fabric of life in the city that she literally dragged us to every single thing that you can imagine. So me, my sister and my brother, we've gone from Dandia to like Guru Nanak's birthdays and like all the langars that you can see, um, as well as like Ganpati Visarjan. Um, but you can imagine these three kids who don't know how to sit on the floor, cross their legs and eat, or like don't know how to eat with their hands. So when she, take, when she used to take us for longer, she used to make sure that she had disposable spoons and forks and wet wipes for us. So we were able to still be a part of the whole experience, but be able to maintain our sanity as well. Um, but back then, I remember just also thinking that why does Santa Claus in India look so different to Santa Claus back in Taiwan? <laughs> the beard just was cotton. It wasn't even actual, like a proper fake beard. I think after that, at the age of 14, we moved to Hong Kong. And I remember my telling my dad, I was like this rebellious, angry teenager. I imagined, because by then, after a few years, I wanted to spend, I made friends in India. I, you know, sort of like imagined myself going to college there. Um, I was in high, just about to enter high school and I had this like dreams of being in the city and, you know, graduating high school with uh, the friends I'd made throughout the years. And then they sort of like uprooted us and moved us to Hong Kong. And I was 14. I was angry. And I remember telling my dad, I hate you for making us move like you ruined my life. This is the end of it all. Um, and he looked at me and he told me back then that, you know, he was like, this is one of the biggest life lessons I'm giving you that. If you can survive this at 14, I promise you, you'll survive everything, anything in your life. Like I can put you anywhere in the world and you'll be able to like communicate and talk and hold, like be confident and hold your presence and hold yourself in a room. And that's something that's so true for all three of us kids that uh, confidence is something we never lack. We never um, are unsure about what we want or how we see things. And I can genuinely be placed anywhere right now and I can talk to a wall even and I'll be very entertained. So I think that's something I have to thank my parents for. So yeah, to answer your question, I think all the moving around as a kid has been one of the biggest life lessons so far. Awesome. I think that helps, that. Sabrina, because I'm having the conversation now with my wife. After 10 years in Chile, I want to go back to India, right? Oh. And I would like to go back. I think the economic prospects of India today are, you know, India is shiny. And I think uh, Chile is going the wrong direction uh, for many reasons, but let's not get into that today. And obviously she's only thinking about the kids. So she's like, you know, yeah. our eight-year-old is going to have a very tough time. I believe you have to know Hindi in the schools there. So she's only thinking about that. And I'm thinking of building resilience and character personality you'll have friends in multiple mm -hmm. you know geographic zones so i hear what you're saying and uh let's see as of now we're still in chile so let's see how it goes yeah and not not just that but it really broadens your mind to all different types of people in geography you know um we moved around a lot as a kid as well from spain to the u.s and within the u.s and um just meeting so many different types of people learning about different cultures it 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 really helps. So I could see where you're coming from, Simran. No, definitely. I mean, sometimes when I was young, I used to go and visit friends' homes and I used to be like, oh my God, you have, you've been in the same house uh, for the entire 20 years and you have your artwork from the time when you're one year old up still on the wall and it's framed. I was like, I have three homes and I literally have like some stuff from my lower school, middle school and upper school, like in three different homes, but not in one place. Um, but now when I look back, I would not do it any other way. And Amit, if yeah. I can talk to your wife, my mom made me learn Marathi. If she could do that wow. and succeed, I think he would. Uh, the only thing I can say right now is a poem in Marathi and I can understand it. Um, but Moving to Bombay right now is definitely something to consider. The city, the countries, there's so much that's not done there yet. Yeah. But Tell us about you your experience. Offer. Tell us about your experience in Bombay, because I believe one of the restaurants uh, that you consulted in was in Bombay. Can you tell us a bit more about that? It was. Um, so after leaving Bombay at the age of 14, we were constantly going back because my parents still had a house there. But then this was pre-MSN and um, I think ICQ was there. This was definitely pre-MSN and Facebook and Instagram. So I sort of lost touch with everyone from my middle school. And then when we started going back to Bombay, it was just to spend time as a family. Um, I didn't have any social contacts there. But then uh, after I finished Cordon Bleu, I sort of felt that Bombay had a lot more exciting food things happening. 
compared to Hong Kong. And I know when I say that, people always give me this quizzical look, being like, what do you mean? That's so, that cannot be true. Um, but uh, sorry, Hong Kong was led by four or five big restaurant groups and that's it. And they were sort of like, you know, monopolizing the entire restaurant scene. And I really wanted to learn from someone um, who was sort of like pushing the envelope and just doing something really different. And I thought Bombay had a lot of people who were doing that. So I basically went to Bombay to study with them or to learn from them and see how that all goes. And before that, you didn't have any restaurant experience before you went to um, school in Paris, correct? You did. That you is media. correct. Okay. I was. So, I was. So I guess twofold question, what made you want to go to this school? And tell me about your first day there and – I read a story about being able to take the cork out of the bottle yeah. of a wine bottle. So I, um, I went like for my university, I was pretty much in, uh, I was in Hong Kong, Singapore, and the States. I was a little bit all over. I graduated and then I started a job in media and lifestyle without planning for it. I mean, I graduated right during the Lehman Brothers crisis. So there weren't that many job opportunities and sort of just stumbled upon whatever I could get my hands on. And I loved it. Um, I really enjoyed it. I was working with a startup on my first day. I was the, That was the first day they had an office. Before that, they were working out of coffee shops. And we were only three staff members. By the time I left, right before going to Paris, we were a team of uh, 25 people in Hong Kong and we were across four cities. So that was my time of properly learning how to grow within a startup and how to manage teams across different countries. And, you know, I was on the cusp. I was in a very cushy and good job. I was really good at it and I was happy doing it. Um, but there was this voice at the back of my head that always wanted to open a restaurant. My entire life from playing restaurant, restaurant as a kid or sort of getting involved with a lot of food projects in high school, that was the only thing I wanted to do. Um, you know, I... I I'm uh, Cindy parents. I was a smart kid. My dad was like, why do you want to go to hospitality management school and fold bed sheets for people at, for room service and hotel management? Why don't you study business? You can always use it in the future. So that's when I studied business. But then, I, you know, at that age, I was like, wait, no, I still want to learn about restaurants. So that's when I went to Paris and it was a restaurant management program, not a hotel management program. And it was definitely one of the best things I've ever done. And I always make a joke about it where I'm like, I had my Emily in Paris moment without the hot neighbor and no pan to make scrambled eggs in. But I still learned how to make the best scrambled eggs because of Paris. That basically explains it. Oh, sorry. I missed your second part. Um, yes, I want to know day. about your first day at Le Cordon yes. Bleu. Yes, uh, so I went to Paris, not speaking a word of French, not um, not knowing anyone in Paris. And you will see this is something that's set as a pattern throughout my life. Uh, I just sort of like deep dive into the unknown and see what comes out. Um, my first day, I went to school. It was my second day in Paris. I was still trying to figure it out. And our first class was uh, a wine class. And we had an entire semester with this wine teacher. And he walks in, it's 10 a.m., it's a Monday morning. And he takes it, he walks in with a glass of wine, takes a sip. He just got us so curious to know what was he drinking and what was he tasting. But he said, before you guys taste, before we do anything more, I want you to go around and tell me what is your favorite wine and which, sorry, which is your favorite wine and why. And I had kids in my class from all over Europe and South America, and they were so proud of their national wines. And they were, you know, sort of saying that we have this wine in Italy. And of course, the Frenchies were talking about their wines and then the wines from Chile. Um, and I felt very proud of being Indian. I've always been very proud of it. And I was like, I think Sula Chanon Blanc is amazing. And he looked at me and he was like, we have a lot of What's work that? to do with you. Like, yeah. don't even, don't even bring piss water into my class. <laughs> yeah. So I've, um, I've not seen um, Emily in Paris, but uh, I'm assuming it's a romantic uh, comedy. Did you fall in love when you were in Paris with your professor? I, I did not fall in love with my <laughs> wine swirling professor. I think my Indian mom, mom told me this one thing. She's like, you go, but you come back home and you marry a Cindy boy for sure. Um, so... Did quite a few dates in Paris, but nothing to write home about particularly. But 
uh, coming back to your cork story, um, the second day that we had this wine teacher, clearly I was just failing everything that he wanted me to do right. He asked us all to open a bottle of wine, but using the traditional wine opener, not the American wine opener. Sorry, Sabrina. Um, and- <laughs> what is the traditional one? Just the little, the little corkscrew, right? Uh, the one, one, the one that you pull down is the American one. Okay. The traditional one is the one that you have it's to basically. It's just this. Exactly, you've got to. And then pop it open. And pop it open, and yeah. I have always used the American one. I don't know how to use the other one. I, you, I have like you know, I've gone to restaurants and they've opened it for me, and he refused to let the class move on until everyone in the class had properly opened the bottle. And now it's been an hour, and I'm trying to make friends with these wow. kids, and they're just looking at me, being like. Can you get a move on? Like, we want to go yeah. for lunch. Like, what is wrong with you again? This is an Emily in Paris moment. Exactly. This is bullying. Yeah. So this is bullying. This is Amethyr. This is <laughs> bullying in its truest form before the Me Too and Wake uh, Society, right? So I think this was like before all of that came out. Um, but can I just say I did open it. And a year later, I graduated as class valedictorian. So maybe the bullying awesome. worked. Um, Congrats. But, and then that's led to a whole journey with wine. I've got my W set exams done. I've done level two, level three. Anyone, I studied harder for my W set level three exam than I did for my GCSE and A levels. So it is not just involving drinking wine and opening bottles and making noises with your mouth. There's a lot more to wine knowledge than that, but we'll save that for another time. And Simran, yeah. I have to tell you, I went to um, Epcot Center. Have you been before? Yes, in Florida. Yes. So, yes. So Epcot Center, there is one country and it's not India because India is not there, but that serves wines from around the world. And they had a a flight of Indian wines. And I was like, I didn't even know this existed. And I, I hesitantly, but excitedly also ordered it. And it was actually delicious. I enjoyed it. There are a lot of wines. This was like um, back in 2016. But since then, uh, I actually explored a lot of wines when I was in Bombay, local wines. There's a lot of great wines being made in Bangalore, in Nasik. Um, there's an amazing rosé. The reds in India are still not up to the mark, but the rosé and the white and even some of the sparkling is pretty good. That's I need to go cool. back and tell my wine teacher a few more things, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Sabrina, we should have done this episode with our wines open, right? I know. I know. We, we should have about... switched the like Simran. Simran joins in the, in the morning, morning. We join in the evening, and <laughs> we've, we've it's always, always happy discussed hour about recording an episode. Yeah, we've always discussed about recording an episode like a bit tipsy. Yeah, maybe we should pause it right now and change it up. We can still yeah. make it happen. Yeah, it's it's five o'clock somewhere, right? So exactly. Um, <laughs> okay, so you graduate as valedictorian, and then you mentioned you were in Bombay and or Mumbai, and you. Um, you joined this restaurant group, correct? Yes. So I um, decided to move to India again on a whim, um, just because I felt like with Hong Kong, sorry, actually I backtrack. I graduated the program with a business plan and I knew the type of restaurant I wanted to open. I knew I wanted to open in Hong Kong and I was so sure of it. I had a plan out. I was like, I'm going to go to Paris, come back, open this restaurant and that's my life. Um, But I came back and I hesitated. I just felt like I wasn't ready yet. And that's what I was referring to earlier, that Hong Kong was pretty much governed, the, sorry, the F&B scene in Hong Kong was governed by five or six main restaurant groups. And there was no place for a newcomer like me to come in and make mistakes. Like I would be scrutinized. I would just be cut out of it completely. And you don't want to do that for your first restaurant. You're definitely going to make mistakes. Um, so I went to Bombay and I Instagram messaged uh, 20 people without knowing who they were, just a cold message. And I said, hey, I'm I'm keen to get in the F&B business. Can we meet up? I would love to know your story and just get a coffee. Uh, 10 of them responded, which is, again, saying a lot about just the way the country is so open to sharing information. This is something that I hold very close to me, that we live in the, we live in the 21st century. Information is free. Do not, be, do not be pricey about sharing your knowledge and your experiences because everyone can just learn from it. And that's what these 10 people did to me. Five of them were restaurant owners and five of them were chefs. Um, all of them told me I should not open a restaurant just yet and I need to go get more experience and I uh, need to go work in restaurants. And I was talking to myself and I was just like, look, I don't want to just go to work in a restaurant because I can be doing that for five years, six years and you'll be doing the same job. 
what I wanted to do was see someone about to open a restaurant and learn from their mistakes. And two of the people who I happened to meet said that they were coming together to open a restaurant. So even though they weren't brand new restaurant openers or launchers, they were coming, they were experienced in their fields, but coming together already added this new element to it. And they offered me this sort of like internship. Um, they said, move to Bombay, help us open the restaurant and we let you learn in every department. You want to learn about recruitment. You want to learn about the bar, about the food, how the menu is made, what the chef is doing, what crockery we're ordering, how we're designing the restaurant, what the light system is, what the sound That's system great. is. Anything you want, just come and just learn Good. from us. But help us out while you're doing it. One of the best experiences I could ask for. Like I loved my program in school, but this was something that no textbook could have taught me. Um, mm -hmm. But it was tough. It was tough being an intern again. I had a career. I just got a diploma. Like at being an intern again and driving. Anyone who's driven in Bombay will tell you it's it's uh, an experience of its own. I lived in Juhu and I used to drive to Kolava to get to this restaurant every day in May. Worst time ever in the year to do this. Um, but I loved it. Oh my God, it was one of the best things. In Hong Kong, we don't drive for very long. I never listen to podcasts. I know it's funny I'm saying this on the show, but I only started listening to podcasts when I was in Bombay driving for three hours every day. Um, and that was my Bombay sort of, that started my love affair with Bombay all over again. And Is the restaurant still around? The confidence? Ahead, Unfortunately sorry. not. Sorry. Then for, the restaurant shut down, um, but they rebranded a couple of times and, and then they went through COVID and then now they finally hit the magic formula and it works so well in that space. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a huge learning experience that I had, um, there were two restaurant groups coming together. So I had experience from five different people um, within those two restaurant groups to learn from and yet it failed. And that itself was a big lesson to know what went right, what went wrong and what could have been done better. The, the magic formula. Can you name the restaurant and what's magic about it? Um, the, you need to always find a restaurant. You need to have a concept that fits the space. You can have a concept already and then uh, just sort of like squeeze it into a space. And I think one of the most important things is you need to be flexible when you open a restaurant. So with this restaurant, they wanted to make it very cool, very sexy. They wanted a cocktail bar downstairs. They wanted the dining room upstairs. They wanted to make sure no kids were allowed. They had a very limited vegetarian menu at the start because they were Vietnamese and they were like, everything in Vietnam had fish sauce. So how can we have like a very big vegetarian menu? And they're opening a restaurant in Colaba. Um, so none of that worked because firstly, people in Bombay do not have a pre-dinner cocktail. They show up at 10 o'clock and they want drinks and dinner, everything at the same time. You tell a parent not to bring a kid to a restaurant, that's not going to fly either. Where are they going to leave their kid? So they had all these people showing up with kids and then saying, what do you mean we can't show up with kids? We're not going to go home right now. Like you let us sit anywhere um, and you need vegetarian food. You need vegetarian. You need to speak to what your audience wants to eat. So you can give rules to someone. Um, and that's something that I basically learned from with them. No, you just Space described in sexy fish in Miami. <laughs> I haven't been to sexy fish in Miami, but I think that a list of restaurants that get it right or don't get it right is very obvious in all over the world. Yeah, sorry. You don't have to need. You don't need to uh, get a degree. You don't need to get a degree to classify that list. You were saying that you need the the concept to meet make the space. No, repeat that. What you said. You need. The concept should match the space or vice yes. versa? I think your concept should match the space. People okay. always start with the concept first, and that's the right way to do it. You're not going to go find the space and then think of the concept. But when you're finding the space, make sure that the concept aligns with it. If you need to make adjustments, you need to fit it around, be flexible while you're doing that. Okay. So after this, you had a, I'm assuming you have a concept in mind because you were looking for a space not in Bombay. Where were you? Because COVID hits then. What happened? What was that all about? Um, so I actually have several ideas. I, am, uh, I have too many dreams. Uh, I have several restaurant concepts that I want to open. And I have several business plans saved on my laptop with the names down, the concept down, the look, the feel. 
I'm someone who loves music. So I even had different Spotify playlists made for each restaurant concept. And even to date, when I hear a song, I will go save it in that playlist because I'm like, I will forget the song eventually. And music is music is eternal. You always want to listen to a great song in a space. Um, so I was actually in Bombay when COVID hit and I pivoted my plan from opening a restaurant in Hong Kong to opening a restaurant in Bombay because I just think the country is booming and there's so much that's not being done um, and there's space for so much more. Um, you're not fighting for the same customer, which is what a lot of restaurants end up doing in Hong Kong. It's a smaller city. It's an island of 7 million. And there is 10 million, just for context. Um, so I was stuck in India at the start of COVID. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's going to be a month. I've, you know, as I live in Hong Kong, we've gone through SARS. We thought it was a six-week thing. And then the world would go back to normal again. So I was like, this is a great six-week time to work on all my business plans, decide which one I want to do first. And which one in two years, which one I want to franchise and all these ideas. Six weeks later, it was like, oh, no, the entire world is in lockdown. It's not just Asia. Um, there's restaurants shutting down. There's only food delivery, not even food delivery happening in the first month. It only started later. Um, and everything just came to a standstill. Um, I've worked my entire adult life and suddenly I had no job, no prospects, um, nothing to figure out. I was like, do I even go back to media and lifestyle? Do I, um, do I just wait around? Do I just keep working on a business plan with no idea when I would finally be able to open? It was even a question of will restaurants ever come back? Will food dining be what it was? Pre, I keep saying this word BC because I think it's very important and for our generation, um, BC right now means before, before COVID. COVID because yes, exactly. It's a, it was a huge question mark in 2020. We didn't know what was happening, and you just kept hearing of um, hospitals around the world being overcrowded, people dying on the streets, and if as long as you're happy, as long as you're at home and safe, that was considered like the best thing you've done all day. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, Sabrina, Anderi. Anderi is a region. It's a suburb of uh, Bombay. It's about okay. an hour and a half, two hour drive, just because I'm not, not everyone's going to know what Anderi is. Can we jump uh, into Spark of Madness? How that came about, yes, the course. recipe book, the website. Tell us about that. So it's a complete COVID project. Um, as I said, I went through probably one of the biggest uh, lulls in my life. Um, during COVID because I just didn't know what my next steps were. And all I was doing, I was living in Bombay by myself. I'm very thankful that I have a nice space to live in. Um, my family was in Hong Kong. So I basically converted that house. Each room was a diff had a different purpose for me to make it fun. I had a TV room, a workout room, my sleeping room. But the main thing I was doing was cooking, cleaning, eating, and getting fat. So I was like, if I got fat, let's make everyone else fat with me as well. And let's publish a cookbook. Um, so I, um, was in Bombay and then Hong Kong had a 14 days quarantine. And my sister told me that, look, you're going to drive us crazy when you're quarantining because now you can't even cook. Uh, just for context, I am not a trained chef. I studied restaurant management in Paris. Any cooking I did was just sort of like for mother's day or like a special occasion. I enjoyed food, but I thought if I'm anyways having to make my meals for during COVID, why don't I? spend some more time on it. I have nothing else to do. So why don't I, um, you know, experiment with different vegetables, different cooking techniques, but at the same time, keeping it vegetarian. I've been a vegetarian for 20 years and keeping it Asian because that's my comfort food um, and healthy at the same time because it was for my own lunch and dinner. So I came back to Hong Kong quarantined and in those 14 days said, I'm going to put all those recipes together. And even if it's just something like that's binded and black and white for myself and my family, this is just something to show that this is what I did during COVID. In those 14 days, clearly anyone can go loony being wrapped up in a room by yourself. I went loony and I decided to publish it and make it a proper book. And I then spent the next month, nine months working on that. Um, every recipe has been tried and tested several times. I actually ran a recipe testing program, which was very, um, I'm very proud of that. It was an idea I had. Um, a lot of cookbook authors, they have contracts, they have people who basically also are testing their recipes because you can be writing down things, but if you're not sure of what you've written down and how does someone else read that and translate that into doing the action of what they have to do, it's not going to work. 
So they have recipe, official recipe testers. And because I was self-publishing, I didn't have that opportunity. So I put it up on social media saying, hi, I have 116 recipes to test and try out. I will send you the recipe with no photograph because I don't want you to get influenced by what it, the end product should look like. I just want you to test it out. And I have seven sections in the book, uh, seven regions of Asia. Tell me which region you would like. And I will give you a choice of three recipes. You choose one out of that and make it by this date and fill out a form for me. And that was it. Um, so I had 130 people from 30 different cities who tested out my recipes for me. That's great. I guess everyone was home at the time. So, and everyone was cooking at the time. Everyone was cooking at the time. And yeah. it was so, it, it really helped me and shape the cookbook together because a tomato. That is so in, great. Yeah. Cause I just, I wanted to keep the cookbook simple. I didn't want it to be too technical and intimidate people who are not people who enjoy cooking or not chefs or uh, necessarily someone who's just been in the kitchen the first time because they got inspired by a recipe. So I just put down one tomato, one onion. And, you know, I had friends from the States who were trying out recipes and saying, this tomato is huge here. Let me just tell you for context that our tomatoes yeah. in Asia are tiny. So then I was like, okay, I have to put oh, down the average yeah. weight of a ours tomato. Are, ours are huge. <laughs> yeah. Or I yeah. had a girlfriend in uh, the UK. I put down something as, you know, to make cornstarch. When you mix cornstarch and water together to thicken a soup or a curry or a gravy, uh, right. a lot of cookbook authors will call, call it cornstarch slurry. And she wrote me this WhatsApp message and she was like, I just want to clarify, was that a spelling mistake or something? Because slurry means manure in the UK. And I was like, okay, I guess I can't. <laughs> what be a great that. educational experience for you to even do this, like your first cookbook and you're learning all these things, like, you know, what someone in Hong Kong may understand, someone in LA is going to read it totally different, right? Exactly. And that yeah. was that. Really so where did the, the name of the book come? Where did the name uh, of the book come from? It's A Spark of Madness. And the book is called A Spark of Madness. The brand is A Spark of Madness. Um, I am a huge, huge Robin Williams fan. Um, he had this very, very famous line that you're only given a little spark of madness. And if you lose that, you're nothing. And everything I've done so far has involved that. You have to be crazy. You have yes. to be mad. Um it's a mad world. And if you don't have that little essence, that little, you know, must be or that joy, that pixie dust of life, then what is it worth? And, and um, I did catch that at the beginning when you said, you know, you were, you spent 14 days in that room that you went a little quote unquote loony, yeah. um, you know, and I think that's, I agree. I think that's what he meant. Like you get that spark of madness, like go for it. I mean, how are you? How was your that. weekend? Oh, yeah, it sorry. was great. You know, it was it was raining here a lot. I'm in um, oh. South Texas in San Antonio, okay. so raining a lot. But so my I have a ten year old daughter. Um, oh. Her soccer game got canceled, but we we made the best. It was a nice, relaxing weekend. You know, we haven't it's, had many of those, so it was great. Thank you for asking. Yeah. What, did you guys watch a lot of TV or? You know, we did. You you mentioned. Um, what did you say? Oh, about eating your mom saying about eating with your, you weren't used to that eating with your hands. Yeah. Have you seen on Netflix, um, Mrs. Chatterjee? My Mrs. mom Norway? saw it. My mom went through this whole mother's day Netflix binge where she saw the How mother cute. at JLo, but she saw it all herself. I, I saw that too. I was like, what is going so, on over here? I, it just like triggered when you said that I watched that this weekend because my parents told me to watch it and wow, like you know, like the cultural differences, I'm not going to tell you anything about it, but one no. of the cultural differences are, you know, is eating with your hands, which we do, right? Like definitely. And, but I remember yeah. even though I'm Indian and my mom was eating with her hands at the good bar, I was like, ew, what do, why would you do that? And then... <laughs> I remember like the first day being in like my school in India and someone like actually licked their like forearm and I was like, where's Coco? Okay, okay. I feel like we need to save this for the podcast because that's funny. <laughs> Let's talk about you. Okay, so you launched this, you self-publish your book and now you have other products as well. I do. Tell so me about them. 
When I uh, was working on the cookbook, it took me nine months, and I said it was my little COVID baby, and that's all I did. Um, it was probably one of the most like energy draining processes because I was up at all hours, sitting in my room and just typing stuff away. You think you're just going to be in the kitchen cooking the whole time, but you actually don't do that much of the cooking. You're more just focused on getting the book together. Um, and then once the cookbook goes to the printer, they they take six weeks uh, to print the book and bring it back to you. And uh, that's when the marketing side sort of kicked in for me. And I was like, okay, what can I do to promote the product or promote the book? And how do I go about it? So I was like, do I do like a launch t-shirt, an umbrella, a wine opener, sort of like have a funny story about Paris to it. But all of that sounded really boring. I hate carrying branded stuff. Like, don't get me wrong. I do love a nice Hermes Birkin, but we will save that for another time. No one needs a Hermes Birkin madness, spark of madness bag. Um, but I decided to do a line of sauces because at the end of the day, I love feeding people. Selling paper was a means to an end because of COVID, uh, but I want people to eat good food and that's what makes me the happiest. So I thought it would might just be a small batch just for the launch. Um, there were the recipes in the cookbook. Uh, so sort of the sauces, I wanted it to be a byproduct of the book and not just be completely off brand. Um, so I decided to call the sauces Spark, keep them Hong Kong inspired. Uh, there were recipes in the cookbook that you could make using the sauces, but doesn't mean that you needed the, to buy the sauces to cook in the book. Uh, I gave you a basic version of how to make all three of these sauces also in the book, but people are lazy and people want to, if they can buy something, why would they bother making it then? And it was a basic recipe. Um, so there are four Hong Kong inspired sauces. There is a crispy chili oil, a caramelized spring onion. Crispy chili oil needs no introduction. It's anyone who's grown up in Asia. We eat way too much Lao Gao Ma, which is the grandma chili oil. I ate that and Indomie every day after school in Hong Kong. So I wanted to make mine as a lot more cleaner, refined. There's a lot more complex flavors going on in that one jar. I eat that every morning. You should not be getting high on your own supply, but I'm guilty of that for sure. Um, the second one is a caramelized spring onion. So it's slow cooked spring onion with notes of sesame and ginger. And it's inspired by Taiwanese pancakes. Sort of like, again, playing homage to Taiwan and where I'm born. And the third one is called crack sauce. It is the most popular one, not just because of the name of the sauce. It is uh, inspired by dandan noodles. So you have flavors of peanut, sesame, brown sugar, chili oil, vinegar. Dandan noodles is a very classic uh, dish from Shanghai, but it's sort of like come across all Chinese uh, regions and across the world. If you've ever gone to Din Tai Fung, you've definitely had a dandan dan noodle that's blown your mind away. Um, so crack sauce was inspired by that. The fourth one is a black truffle chili oil. So sort of like, you know, again, Hong Kong with the East and West coming together in this little island city of ours. It's Italian black truffle with eight different Asian chilies. Wow. That sounds um, delicious. They all yes. do with that. The last one hit the nail on the head. What about money? I mean, are these uh, profitable? Uh, how much do you sell? What's the price of one? Is it a $10 bottle or is it a $50 bottle? Can you give us an idea of how profitable this venture is? At the end of the day, I have Cindy parents. If it wasn't making money, my dad would be very disappointed in me. It has to make money. Uh, so um, it is ten, roughly around 10 US a bottle. Um, so far, it's only being available, sold in Hong Kong. The plan is to take it overseas. Um, Everything that I've done so far with A Spark of Madness has been very reactive. For someone who told you that she has multiple business plans for her different restaurants and Spotify playlists, I have nothing for A Spark of Madness. I have no business plan. I don't have any financial sh sheet drawn out, but it's doing okay. And um, I'm sort of like constantly having mad ideas and seeing what to do with it and where to take it. And um, this uh, post this summer, I've told myself now it's been two years of Spark of Madness. You need to put down a proper plan. Uh, but the plan is to take it across Asia, the sauces, and then hopefully the rest of the world. Oh, let's... I think those sauces would do phenomenal here in the U.S. So I, I say you go a little bit more well... mad. And start exactly. penetrating Sabrina, I think market. after this podcast goes live and, you know, all our audience listens to it, I think many people will approach her for the sauces. Yeah. I hope so. I think so. They sound delicious. Um, so Amit and I heard, or we read an interview, uh, last year you stated one of your goals is to build a better relationship with money. 
you say in this interview, it's a topic that is not discussed often, and we are always questioning how much we need it. Um, as we talk about you building this international brand, have you built a better relationship with money? Um, I think that's something that's constantly evolving. And again, that comes down to our culture, who we are. We've always known to save for that rainy day and, um, you know, and also have assets. It's such a huge part of who we are, right? You have extra money, put it in property. You have a little bit less, but you still have it. Buy jewelry, buy watches. That's something that we've just been so, it's been embedded yeah. in our upbringing. Um, that, but we're constantly questioning, I guess, um, how much do we need? How much do we need for not just ourselves, for our family in the future? Uh, that rainy day, what happens? Um, what do we count as valuable right now? It's quite different for, I would say, our generation where we value experiences more than the necklace that's sitting in the locker for God knows, waiting for a wedding to wear it, but then that's it. Um, and it's just sort of like questioning what is important and what is needed. And I do think that the relationship with money is still constantly evolving. Uh, you can you can never have enough, but it shouldn't be dictating how you live your life and what should happen with it. So, and I think being an entrepreneur, um, you're constantly striving for more, but it's also just being happy with what is coming your way. Yeah. I like your outlook bit. Um, I guess it's so subjective because other people, you know, we talk to their objectives or goals with money are completely different, right? A lot of them are still materialistic, but I, I like your outlook. I, I think I align myself with you more. Yeah, that was my little Elmo trying to be Yoda line. Yeah. What yeah, about I the like wedding? It. You mentioned the wedding. Are you married? Are you? Uh, do you have your jewelry saved for that big day? <laughs> I think I should get my mom on the call. Maybe she'll answer that better for me <laughs> than myself. I'm not married. I am looking. So if there's anyone who's out there, please do let me know. Um, anyone wants to be part of the Spark of Madness ride, whether taking the sauces or uh, going off on a crazy holiday, uh, do contact me. But uh, I do, I think my parents have the jewelry sorted out. Again, it's something I don't spend time on because I don't value that as an asset for me. For me, an asset would be um, how we live our lives and what we do with it and what experiences we build along the way and the people we end up being. I think yeah. that's yeah. what matters more to me than um, sure. the big wedding, the big Cindy. Sabrina, what, wasn't our first two guests, weren't they both single? <laughs> we may just have an Indian explorers connection I here. So. I think Auntie Seema needs to like move out of the way. There's someone new on the block right yeah. now. Yes. Indian Explorers matchmaking yeah. service. No. <laughs> but hey, you know what? She's really busy traveling though, because when we had technical issues, you said um, you also have pop-up restaurants and you just told me that you are going to be going to Dubai and London for your pop-up dinners, yes. correct? So um, part of, again, part of the launch plan, uh, when it came to the book, I was like, okay, I have the sauces, I have the cookbook, now what? I can do this big launch party and get everyone to come out. Um, but learning from you know my past in media and lifestyles that people come out, or even just attending events, people come out, they don't actually connect with the brand. They eat the nibbles, they mingle with their friends, and then they leave. And uh, they might buy the cookbook and that's it. They've not had any association with the brand. Um, so I decided to do a pop-up dinner and do this concept called the mad dinner, which is basically a seven course menu from the cookbook. And we do one dish from each section of the book. So we take the guests on a journey through Asia. We have a dish from Thailand, Taiwan, Indonesia, India, Seoul, Singapore, all in one menu and everything that you can make yourself using the cookbook. So it's not complicated food. It's not rocket science. You're going to have comfort food, but with full flavor. And the focus is to make sure that you're also trying different vegetables. So I've been a vegetarian for very long, but I hate being an advocate. I hate, as I said, I don't want people to, I don't want to force people to eat something without them wanting to eat it. But do I want to uh, sort of expand your horizons and make you try something different and see if you like it? Maybe. So with the mad dinner, no vegetable is repeated throughout the menu. We use a different vegetable for each dish. And we've done it uh, quite a few times right now. So we've done it five times in Hong Kong uh, with a different menu each time. I traveled with it to Bombay. 
again, COVID has really been instrumental in the growth of my business. I went to Bombay and I got stuck again with the lockdown when Omicron hit and the Hong Kong government made me do a washout in Singapore and Bangkok for a week each before I was allowed to come back and enter Hong Kong and then quarantine again for 14 days. Um, clearly, I don't learn my lesson. I should have just stayed put in one place throughout COVID, but I'm mad. What can I say? Um, so then I decided to do the mad dinner in Singapore and Bangkok. Uh, and so sort of making it a work and fun trip. And that sort of decided, just opened this whole horizon of like, wait, I can travel with this concept. I can travel with the mad dinner. So since then it's happened in Manila, it happened in Singapore again. And this summer I'm taking it to London and Dubai and hopefully Madrid. Uh, I'm still waiting for a confirmation on that, but it should be fun. That, that is, is so awesome. Fun. It really is. Um, let's, let's uh, you mentioned the relationship with money. Uh, can you define what success is for yourself? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, this is a catch-22 for me. So I think I don't give a chance to myself to enjoy success. Um, bef- when I've achieved something or just on the cusp of achieving something, when I see it so close, I've already jumped onto the next dream. I've already jumped onto the next goal. So when I achieve it, it doesn't hit me. I don't, I don't take pride in it. I'm like, oh, it happened. Yeah, so what? What's the big deal? Now we've got this bigger fish to fry. I know I'm a vegetarian. I shouldn't, but still. Um, and I'm thinking about the next thing that I should be doing and why haven't I start, started working on it yet? Um, I should look back and sort of enjoy it a little bit more, but I don't have a definition to success. I've got I've just got too many dreams that I want to make to happen, and I'm going to focus on that instead. So is that how you felt when you climbed Kilimanjaro? Because... That is no easy feat for anyone. It is. I actually, uh, a lot of my friends meet me after. I just climbed Kili a month ago. And a lot of my friends, when they meet me, they're like, how was it? And I was like, how was what? And they were like, climbing Kili. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, I did it. I did it. Uh, and they're like, yeah, we know you did it. Tell us more. And I was like, oh, it was just something I decided on a whim. It was a birthday that I had. And I wanted to be out in the mountains. And I thought, why not challenge myself and climb Africa's highest mountain? Um, And it was one of the best things I did. Being out in the mountain for someone who loves uh, spending time in their daydreams is the most ideal place to be. Um, How long were you out there for? I was uh, on Kili for seven days. So six nights, seven Seven days. days. And Um, do you know the elevation you went up to? 5,895. Um, okay. meters high and for someone who's always lived on sea level um, that was I think a little bit of a daunting part the only training I had done before climbing Kili was I spoke to my guide uh, whoever decides to go Kili again please message me I'll tell you the exact uh, go about on how to do it but when I spoke to my guide I basically uh, asked him how should I train and he was like climb a mountain and I was like okay but we are on sea level in Hong Kong like I can go yeah. hiking um, and he was he was like okay why don't you just climb up and down your building I heard Hong Kong has a lot of skyscrapers I think he was joking but I took it very seriously so I live on the 27th floor uh, plus we have a few garage floors so I was going up and down my building in my trekking boots a few times and I think that training actually helped because Kili was I enjoyed climbing it it wasn't hard so How was the, with the elevation, you didn't have any um, sickness, elevation sickness at all? Uh, I took altitude sickness pills. So as I said, if you ever decide to go, I'll give you the full list. I took altitude sickness pills and they re- uh, spent six days acclimatizing you to the altitude. So every day you climb high and you sleep low. Uh, so your body is just constantly getting used to it. Um, that being said, the summit day is the hardest day. You wake up at 11 yeah. p.m. You climb for seven hours. You reach uh, Stella Point, which is at 5,700 meters. And you're climbing the entire thing. Luckily for us, it was uh, a full moon night that night. So we had the best stars and the moon. But you have so many layers on that when you look up, you're you're just hitting your layers before you actually see the moon. Um, But when you get to Stella Point, there is a kilometer walk and there just is a gradual increase from 5,700 to 5,895. That was the hardest part for me. That 185, 195 meter difference. 
up there was probably one of the hardest things. Uh, but then you see it, you're, you're, you're just surrounded by sunrise and you can see it, the gold's right there. You spend seven days wait, or six days at that point waiting for it to like to get there. Uh, you want to hold your flag of your country up there. For me, I wanted to hold my India flag. I wanted to hold my Hong Kong flag. I wanted to hold my spark chili bottle and get that marketing shot up there. So that was everything that had to happen. I think we're very different, Simran, you and me, because that sounds to me like not a lot of fun. That sounds something like painful. <laughs> and even the thought of a 21 kilometer marathon is just why? I don't get it. I don't get it why people are obsessed with achieving these milestones and these personal goals. I mean, each to their own. Sabrina, what about you? Would you want to climb a mountain? I actually, Simran, I asked about the altitude sickness because I climbed, or I did rim to rim the Grand Canyon Ooh. in one day. It's approximately 20 miles, I believe. So you climb from one side, you you hike down and then hike up. You cross the Colorado River and hike up. And there was Whoa. a point where the altitude hit me and it was projectile vomits. Um, and then I don't know what my best friend gave me, some energy powder. And she's like, just take this. And I did not think I was going to get out of that canyon. Oh my but God. just like you, you see the end and that adrenaline just c kicks in. And to me, just getting out of there alive was success. You know, I did it in one day and it just being able to hit that. She goal gave you Coke, Sabrina. Really. It was like hardcore cocaine. <laughs> you know what? I, 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 thank God. Cause it got me out of there. I mean, it was, the sun had set, you could hear wolves and we're just like, yeah. oh, well, I love how we the guy from Chile. Alive. Yeah. No, I love how the guy from Chile knows exactly what the drugs were. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope so um but everyone has their goals right for me i remember it when i was in my 20s i was chasing music festivals i just wanted to go for every festival from ultra to edc to sunburn to tomorrowland and then when i turned 30 i was like oh need to change this around let's do marathons and mountains and let's just keep going at it and see what happens and you just sort of like get your adrenaline rush or adrenaline fix in on grand canyon or and then somewhere else, Amit, you no, tell us what I think goes. I think once you marry, uh, your spouse will take away some of your energy. And then when you have children, <laughs> that, that little energy you had left is is Gets it's completely drained. Are they sucking the no, life I just out think of you? you? I think we <laughs> age more once we get married and we have children. Don't get me wrong. I recommend it to anybody, all my single friends. I told them it's the best experience ever, especially having kids. But uh, I don't know. I stopped. Uh, I stopped thinking about what makes me happy and about what I want to do. It's whatever the kids want to do. You know, it's all about them now. Once you have uh, children in your life, I know people are like that with their pets. I've never wanted to have pets. I think my kids are, uh, you know, I'm expecting a third now in July. So, Quite yeah, so we're sure. pretty, I mean, we've got two boys. I'm expecting a third boy in July. So I can't really think about anything else right now, but climbing, it, even before I had children or was married, I go hiking over here in Santiago and I enjoy it because of the fitness. It's 45 minutes up and 30 minutes down. Uh, but after doing it and my yeah. knees start hurting and I can't play soccer that week, I'm like, why? Why did I do that? You know? <laughs> just to go to the gym. That's when, you have your three, now. Yeah. <laughs> That's when you have your three masseuses at home. Massaging. Yeah, maybe in Hong Kong or Bali you can do that. Yeah, I was like, we don't do that in the say, U.S., no, I wish. I was going to say, aren't your kids your masseuse? Like, at least they can, if they're leeching off uh, you, they should have a payback eight, somewhere. Eight they're years bad old, two and a half years old. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay, that's yeah. a big yeah. gap. Soon. Just a little bit of training anyway. Yeah. I want to know, you know, you, you were looking to open a restaurant around the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. You have several business plans, which I think is absolutely fantastic. How do you pivot when something goes wrong in one of your plans? Oh, that's a, I, I think COVID made us all purveyor of pivoting. So I think we all have become masters of if plan A doesn't work, then we've got plan B. If plan B doesn't work, then there's plan C. Um, I think life keeps throwing you a lot of, you know, curveballs and I've had my fair share of them. Um, 
But as long as I know I'll open the restaurant, I'm not doubtful of that. I know it will happen, yeah. whether it happens. I think for the longest time, I was like, it needs to happen by this age. It needs to happen in this country. And then I need to meet five restaurants more. Um, I'm okay. I will get that dream to happen. I will, I have, I as I said, I'm a dreamer. I have dreams for when I turn 40. I have dreams for when I turn 50 at 60. I know what I want. And whether it, how it happens, I don't know, but I will figure it out. It will happen. I like that. Very good. Thank you. You go first, Sabrina. The Simran, the rapid fire, we kind of, uh, it's, we change them every week and uh, we, we like to answer as well, sometimes. So Simran, your favorite restaurant in the world, choose one. Um, so I've got Americano in uh, Bombay. One of the, it's just the best restaurant. You, it's one of the, I wouldn't say it's the best restaurant in the world, but it's the best restaurant for me. The food's amazing. The staff knows how I want certain things. The staff knows everyone. They kind of make, as soon as you walk in there, they make you feel comfortable enough that they will get you excellent service. The chef knows how to give food to the Indian audience without making it a Manchurian. He's giving you American Italian food. He's giving you that full flavor. He makes his pizza from scratch. He makes his pasta from mm -hmm. scratch, but yet he has a butterscotch nut ripple ice cream on his menu because that's nostalgia for us in Bombay. Like we grew up eating uh, rapid fire. So that's number one. Second one. Yes. yes second one. <laughs> second one. A second one. We can keep talking. Um, Kikusan in Hong Kong. Super simple, not great service, um, quick in, quick out, but oh my God, their dumplings are pockets of heaven. They are just the world's best vegetarian dumplings. And it's not a veggie restaurant. There's something for everyone. Excellent. Now you both. Sabrina. You, are, you guys are going to laugh. I cannot think of one because I am not married to a foodie, but I'm going to have to go with the Olive Garden. Do you guys ever visit the Olive Garden in the <laughs> yeah. US? And the reason I say that, the food is good, and we always go there on special occasions because that's where my parents and our daughter like to go. And we have a great time. So it's a win-win. So, so, I said it here, Olive Garden, when you're Sabrina, there, your family. Sabrina, you would not fit good. in in any Hong Kong uh, fine dining yeah. meal. I know. You would be thrown out if you get that answer. No. You would be thrown out, I tell you now. There's something for that's you so here, American Sabrina. American that is, me, right? that is that's the so most American. American redneck answer. That's the most Republican Midwest Sabrina's in Texas, answer I've ever heard. Okay, I'm going for two, since uh, our guest has come up with two. I'm going to go for uh, Royal China in Colaba, Bombay, not in London, because of value for money. It's half the price. And I love uh, the dumplings in Zhou Shanghai in New York, in Chinatown. Yeah. Okay, next. Uh, if you were to have dinner, Simran, with these three people, who would you rather go for on a one-on-one -on -one dinner with? Uh, Salt Bay, uh, James, okay. uh, uh, James Ramsey, or, or Jamie Oliver? Sorry, Gordon Ramsey. Gordon Ramsey, Jamie yeah, Oliver, or Salt Bay? Oh, not very good choices. I thought you'd give me better. Mm, no. This is a very forceful dinner combination. Ah, uh, Gordon Ramsay. Gordon. At least he'd make me laugh. Yeah, fair enough. I think, I think people who are slightly eccentric uh, excite me. He's fun to watch. He's fun to watch on TV. Yeah. yeah. Even if it's a one date, yeah. right? <laughs> Sabrina? Okay. I pick, I, I'm not picking from the list because I don't know them really well. But I picked, Do you have you guys ever seen Nailed It on Netflix? The baking show? Nope. Oh. No. Oh, you guys have to watch this. My daughter got me into it and it's a baking show. They have to, Bake. um, they give you like a cake or a cupcake and you have to recreate it in a, a certain amount of time. And these are amateur bakers. Like it would be like me going on it. It is hilarious. And the host is excellent. So I would pick What's her. her name? She's funny. Okay. I don't know, but the show's <laughs> nailed it. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. What's the next question, Sabrina? Okay, hey, you didn't answer. Uh, you know what? Uh, I was surprised. I went to uh, Nuzerat in Miami, the Salt Bay's restaurant, and I I thought it'd just be overpriced. You know, the cheapest bottle of wine was three fifty US, and I enjoyed the meal. I I didn't get that ex you know the whole personal experience, but I thought the quality of the of the meat was excellent, and uh, I would go. I would like to get to know Salt Bay. Yeah, why not? Okay. 
Okay, Simran, what are you addicted to? What makes you, quote, unquote, melt, food-wise or otherwise? Could be Brad Pitt. Could be anything. Oh, I thought we're so sticking to, I still think of food categories. I didn't realize we're getting celebrities. No, it could be, uh, it doesn't have to be food-wise. What makes you melt? It could be anything, anyone. I was going to say nachos food-wise. I just thought of cheese melting and I was like, food, done. (laughs) It's tough. You could do nachos. Let's let's stick with nachos for now. If I come up with something else before the end before the end of rapid fire, then I Sabri- might. Sabrina, around. you both go. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say pizza since we're sticking with food. Okay. Oh, now I'm at pizza. Either stick with it melt. or change it. Up. Uh, what makes me melt? What I look forward to eat? No, His I wife. think uh, for me it's dim sum. I love dim sum. You're clearly not winning any brownie points today with your wife. You call them leeches. You don't say they make you melt. Uh, Simran, my wife. <laughs> You're in the dog. My wife today. has not seen a single episode and is not going to see an episode. Yeah, so he's fine. Don't worry about her. You lucky, lucky, you lucky. Daddy. Yeah, don't worry about her. All right, uh, next one. If uh, I gave you um, an advertising board in New York Times Square, and in that board you could, you have to pick say five, 10 words, your legacy, what would those words be? Ooh, that's very Roy Logan-esque. Now I'm like thinking of succession. I'm like, what would my yeah. legacy be? Um, a girl who dreamed she could do it all. A girl who dreams she could do it all. That's really Simple. nice. I yeah. like that. I don't uh, You know what? Right now. I don't have I one also. It's too deep a question. Oh. Which is no, what that it, was like, per- and, and that was perfect. And I, that's a trick that question. A question. <laughs> Why do I have to answer and not you both? But you know what? We can't even follow yeah, that. Yeah, up. that's, that you know perfect. what? We're, we're, we're ashamed of our answers. So it's going to leave it at that. <laughs> Sabrina, rapid fire. Next. That is not fair. <laughs> okay. Uh, favorite TV show or book you've read? Or in podcast, the like Indian Explorers. It could be anything, you know. Or podcast. Grow open. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's start with Indian Explorers, subtle product placement, just everyone. In the last week, I've heard all three episodes of the Indian Explorers. It's like, what am I getting into? Um, okay, favorite TV show in the last three months? Um, or book. TV show, The Last of Us. I think anyone who's seen it, it was just beautiful. The way that human emotions were shown. That episode where that couple's enjoying a meal and their wine after the shit that's going on around the world is just beautiful. Um, also love Jewish matchmaking. Don't like Indian matchmaking, but Jewish matchmaking on Netflix just out recently. Everyone should watch it. Um, favorite book that I read in the last three months, I reread The Alchemist uh, again on Kilimanjaro. I've read it four times in my life. Every time I've been at a cusp or I sort of like at a curveball, that book has always provided me some great answers. So those would be my... Sabrina? Okay, I just watched um, recently Comey Rule on Netflix. It was excellent. Um, Gets the emotions up again about our election process here. And... Mm. I'm reading a book. You guys are going to kill me. It's the um, Harry. What's up? Oh, Megan. Um, Megan Markle. No, no, no. Yeah, it's <sighs> Harry's book. I'm reading it right uh, now. What's it called? So. Did Spared. You read? Spared. Spare. 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 Yeah. Did, yeah. When you go first, I'm going to have something to say about uh, Harry. What am I reading right now? I'm watching the NBA highlights. I'm watching NBA. And uh, I saw a show on Apple TV with, what's her name? Uh, J- Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Gardner. The, the last thing I, oh, the last uh, thing I told him. The last thing he, the, the last thing yeah, he told yeah, me. Yeah, I just finished it yesterday and I, I, I enjoyed it. It was different. I'm watching that and I'm watching Priyanka Chopra in Citadel, which is time pass, mm. but nothing, uh, nothing too fun or exciting to share really about how they've uh, sort of like promoted that they were in a car crash or a near death experience. Yeah. And basically everyone said that there was nothing happening. And the New York police was like, where would a car, where would a car race happen with the paparazzi and a driver in New York city? Please. I, I can't stand those two. And there's no, I can't footage. stand the two. There's no, but Sabrina likes them. There's nothing. Car. Sabrina likes them because of Oprah. I do like them but- because of Oprah. Yeah, they're they're Oprah's neighbors, and I'm an Oprah fan, so fair enough. No, but that's not why I like them. I do. I, I like Sabrina them. likes everyone. Simran, it's annoying. She likes everyone. <laughs> I do. Okay, I do. last question. Yeah. She makes she makes up for you, Amit. With all whoever you don't like, she makes up for. I, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, last one. Uh, you're in jail. You're about to be executed, and you have one last meal. What is it? 
a bottle of Barolo wine, um, the egg fried rice, and spark crispy chili with the egg fried rice. That's it. Simple. And with, with some uh, spark of madness sauces? Yeah, the spark crispy chili oil Great. with the egg fried rice, and that's it. Got it. Sabrina? Like, I'm going to do um, pizza <laughs> and uh, Olive Garden a, pizza. a nice... Uh, with pineapple? No, with I pineapple on top? One. <laughs> no pineapple. I don't do pineapple. So pizza and wine is my go-to for a special occasion. So I'm going to do pizza and wine. And although I have not tried your chocolate bark yet, I'm going Ooh. to add that for my last piece. Of How can you have that if you've not tried it? How can you? That can that be your last meal? Yeah, because you because I I trust her. Um, wonderful. That's big responsibility. I'm like yeah. feeling like the pressure on right uh, now. It's the last thing you're yeah. ever gonna have in your life, and it's something I've made. It's the last bite I'm gonna have. Yeah, not even the part of the It's the last bite. I think I'll go for my mom's Spanish up. omelet. Uh, Oh, uh, Coke a Zero one. and uh, some popcorn. Your mom makes an amazing yeah. Spanish omelet, so that's a good one. Um, I think we've run out of time, Simran. I know we could get into more details, yes. but uh, we have our producers and we have a you know a certain time limit we've got. I want to thank you. Uh, this has been fun. I hope to meet you in my next trip uh, to Hong Kong, maybe October. I'll give you a call if I'm in town. And uh, thank you so much. It's been fun. Yes, thank you, Simran. It's been awesome having you on. I love how you said you deep dive into the unknown in everything you do. And I find that um, adventurous part of you to be so fascinating. So I appreciate you sharing that with us today. No, thank you both so much for having me and for speaking to me and listening to all my ramblings about random things. But I'm very excited to meet both of you. Sabrina, I hope you're joining along in October and we can get you pizza and wine, not from Olive Garden, but somewhere very good in Hong Kong. And um, it's going to make a Spanish omelet and we can see how it goes from there then. Yes, clearly I need to broaden my food horizon. So we need to meet soon in person. But thank you again, uh, everyone who's listening. We really appreciate you doing so. Um, we hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Simran today. And if you have, please share it. Please subscribe and introduce us to our next guest. So again, thank you, Simran, for joining us. And thank you to our wonderful producers, Salvador and Delphi. We couldn't do this. And don't cancel us just, just because Sabrina likes Olive Garden, guys. Please. The OG. Bye. See you next week. Thank you.